to visit the world's largest collection of Grand Prix racing cars. And I'm in this delicious 1931 Invicta, because 1931 was the first year that Donington Park held a motor sporting event, right here in the Midlands in England. And Donington Park is the home of the Donington Grand Prix car collection. Look at that, two of my great heroes here to greet me. Juan Manuel Fangio and Ayrton Senna. You know, this collection came about through the inspiration of just one man, Tom Wheatcroft. He didn't go to school at all until he was 12, and he left when he was 13 to have an apprenticeship in the building trade. He fought in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East during the Second World War. When he came back home here to the Midlands, he started his own building company. Well, he was so successful, he soon made his fortune, and then he could indulge in what he loved the most, motor racing. He started buying all kinds of old cars, including great Grand Prix cars. Trouble is with Tom, once he started collecting, he couldn't stop. He's now well into his 80s, and he isn't finished yet. He's still collecting. So, let's go inside, shall we, and see exactly what he's got on offer. Wow, where do you start? Everything is here. Porsches, Coopers, Brabham's, McLaren's and Lotuses. Just amazing. Look at this, for instance. This is a 1960 Lotus 18 that was used in 1961 by Sterling Moss to win the Monaco Grand Prix in that actual car. Here's an early Lotus 49. Well, when Jimmy Clark and Graham Hill were set loose in those, they revolutionized Grand Prix racing. The engine is a stressed member bolted directly to the back of the monocoque. And a sweet little Lotus 25. Now, that also revolutionized Grand Prix racing by having an aluminium monocoque chassis as well with a Coventry Climax engine behind it. Jimmy Clark won five Grand Prix in that car. And the Lotus 72. Well, Jochen Rindt won four Grand Prix in his before he was killed and won the World Championship posthumously at Monza in 1970. Emerson Fittipaldi won his first World Championship in the later 72. Oh. McLaren cars' contribution to motor racing ever since they kicked off in the 1960s has been absolutely phenomenal. And here at Donington, there's a complete hall dedicated to all their open-wheel racers, with engines by Mercedes-Benz, Peugeot, Honda and Ford. All their World Championship winning marks are represented here. And think of some of the drivers who've driven for them. Emerson Fittipaldi, James Hunt, Nicky Lauda, Alain Prost, Mika Hakkinen, David Coulthard, and perhaps the greatest of them all, the truly phenomenal Ayrton Senna. Perhaps the most pivotal car here in the McLaren Hall is the MP4 8A. This is the very car that Ayrton Senna used to win the 1993 European Grand Prix right here at Donington Park. He drove like a god in the most soaking wet conditions imaginable. Sadly, a year later, he would be dead. There are some 30 years that separate these two great McLaren Formula One cars. The 1970s machine, it's got steel tubular suspension, fiberglass bodywork, aluminium monocoque, a Ford 3-litre engine giving perhaps 450 horsepower, and low, wide, slick tyres. And the 21st century machine, well, it's got carbon fibre suspension, Kevlar bodywork, it's got a carbon fibre monocoque chassis, it's got a Mercedes-Benz engine giving 900 horsepower, still only 3 litres. But the biggest difference between these two cars lies in the way that air was managed in this car. It is so tricky aerodynamically that those guys wouldn't believe the technical progress that's been made. I am so surprised to see this 1940 Auto Union here. It's got a 1.5-litre V12 twin supercharged engine in the back. 
And it was built because Auto Union was so impressed with Mercedes winning the 1939 Tripoli Grand Prix with their V8 car, one and a half litres of course, they decided to build that for 1940. But World War II was in full flood and the car accordingly never raced. We'll never know how it would have got on against the Alfettas and the Maseratis as well as Mercedes-Benz. And look at this. It's an Eagle Westlake from 1966. Dan Gurney, who'd been a works driver for Ferrari, BRM and Porsche, decided the best way forward for him was to build his own cars, which is precisely what he did. And he won the 1967 Belgian Grand Prix, the first American driver to win in an American car at a European Grand Prix since Jimmy Murphy in the 1920s in his Duesenberg. And Lance Reventlow's Scarab. Lance was the son of Barbara Hutton, the Woolworth heiress. They had plenty of money to spend on this car, but by the time they started to get it competitive, they realised far too late the engine was in the wrong place. It needed to be behind the driver at that time. Frank Williams first got involved in motor racing in the 1960s. By the late 1970s, he was not only a Grand Prix boss, he was actually producing his own Williams Formula One cars, ably assisted, of course, by his right-hand man, Patrick Head. In 1980, Alan Jones won the first World Championship for him, followed by Kiki Rosberg, Nelson Piquet, Nigel Mansell, Damon Hill, and Jacques Villeneuve. And when you look at Williams' cars, they were powered by Ford engines, Honda engines, Renault engines, and then, of course, latterly by BMW engines. I have to say, though, as I walk up this wonderful line of Williams cars here at the Donington Collection, it's fascinating to have a look at them, and it's really like a history lesson of the development that took place in Grand Prix racing from the late 70s right up to date. And, of course, we certainly haven't heard the last of Frank Williams and his Grand Prix team yet. I found a very nice little Italian red corner here at Donington. This is a 1955 Lancia D50 designed by Vittorio Iano, two and a half litre V8 engine. And next door to it, a 1957 Maserati 250F, one of the great classic Grand Prix cars of all times, also a two and a half litre car. Have a look at this. This is a 1948 Maserati 4CLT, the very first type of Grand Prix car with its one and a half litre supercharged engine that one Manuel Fangio drove when he first came to Europe from Argentina. The late Ken Tyrrell was a great stalwart of Grand Prix racing, especially in the 1970s. When he and Jackie Stewart got together, they were literally unstoppable. This is Tyrrell 003. And in 1971, Jackie Stewart won not just the World Championship, but also five Grand Prix with it, and the further two Grand Prix in 1972. In 1976, this wonderful P34 six-wheel car won a Grand Prix, the Swedish Grand Prix, driven by Jody Schechter, and it too is on show here. It caused a revolution when the car was new, and just look at it, it's hardly surprising. Talking of Jackie Stewart, of course, he also later in his life became a Grand Prix boss and this is the first Stuart car that he built and in its fifth Grand Prix, would you believe, this little car came second in the Monaco Grand Prix which is a fantastic result. Here it is at Donington. During the later 1950s, Britain's hopes for Grand Prix results lay very firmly with the Van Wall team and in 1958 they won the World Constructors Championship with their Formula One cars and had some fantastic drivers like Sterling Moss doing the business for them. Tony Brooks too, of course. They're very well represented here in the Donington Collection, the best selection, in fact, of Van Walls in the world. This is a sweet little car there. It's a 1950 Ferrari 125, a one and a half litre formula car, V12 supercharged. It's the very first car that the founder of the Donington Collection, Tom Wheatcroft, bought, and he had an awful lot of fun with it. I think there was a minor accident once, I'm not sure, but it's, it's been completely rebuilt, and here it is. And also in this hall, is the most wonderful selection of BRM, British Racing Motors Machines. Well, there's their first 1948 V16. It's got a one and a half litre engine, would you believe, with two superchargers giving 500 horsepower. First Grand Prix they won was in 1959 with a two and a half litre BRM. Joe Bonnier drove the car. There's an example of it. Two and a half litre rear engine car. And then, of course, the one and a half litre formula. Well, this is the stack pipe car that Graham Hill drove to his world Drivers' Championship in 1962. 
There's a Yardley BRM here. Yardley Cosmetics, one of the very first companies to take commercial sponsorship of Formula One really seriously. And BRM were the first people to bring in Marlboro. There's a Marlboro BRM, three litre car. But by the early 1970s, the death knell for BRM was being rung. Jean-Pierre Beltoise won a very wet Monaco Grand Prix for them in 1972. And really, that was about it. There's a nice little American section here. Curtis's and, well, here's a 1954 typical Indy front-engine roadster. Of course, it's got an Offenhauser four-pot engine in there. Disc brakes, I notice, and torsion bar suspension, quite modern for the time. But altogether, rather a nice little selection right here at Donington. For me, strangely enough, the most pivotal car in the whole Donington collection is this. 1948 Cis Italia, designed by that genius, Dr. Ferdinand Porsche. He got everything right in this little car. The engine was behind the driver, independent suspension, tubular space frame, all the things that we've now come to take for granted as being necessary. It was a one and a half litre, flat 12 engine car. Two-stage supercharged. You know, in my opinion, every single Grand Prix car and Indy car running today owes some of its allegiance, in some form or another, to this little Cis Italia. And the shame is, It'll never run again. Even though it's not a Grand Prix car, there's one car that Tom Wheatcroft always wanted. A Bugatti Royale, especially the Coupe Napoleon. Well, one of them came up for auction, and when it fetched £6 million, which at the time was something over $10 million, Tom was astonished. And what he said was, I can build one for less than that. Well, he did. This all 20 foot of it and seven foot wide is a complete replica of the Bugatti Royale Coupe Napoleon. He even built a complete spare engine for it. 12,763 cc's, 300 horsepower. Now only Tom could think of doing a thing like that. Tom Wheatcroft is not just a collector of great racing cars, he's also been deeply involved in sponsorship. In 1971, he was at the Monaco Grand Prix and noticed the talent of a young local driver to him, Roger Williamson. Together, they won two Formula 3 championships, entered some Formula 2 races, and in 1973, Roger wound up with a BRM Formula 1 test drive and then drove for Tom in a march at the Dutch Grand Prix. Sadly, he rolled the car, it caught fire and blew up eventually, and he perished. It's a great sad ending to a great driver, but the tribute to Roger is here at Donington. During the 1920s and 30s, there was a crying out need in Great Britain for a real Grand Prix racetrack. Although we had Brooklands, which was built in 1907, the world's first ever purpose-built speed bowl, the infield there, which was called the mounting course, wasn't really up to putting on a Grand Prix. And Britons are not allowed to race on public roads on the mainland, so good round-the-town Grand Prix like Monaco and Po were definitely out. And of course, the Italians have built Monza, and the Germans had built Nürburgring, we needed somewhere to have a Grand Prix. Donington filled that bill admirably. The first Grand Prix in 1935 was really successful. So it was the 1936 race. So much so that the two greatest Grand Prix teams in the world, Mercedes-Benz and Auto Union, decided to contest the 1937 event. It was a phenomenal race, ultimately won by Bernd Rosemeyer, the Auto Union ace. Unfortunately, he was killed in a terrible accident on an autobahn doing a land speed record attempt. But for the next year, 1938, Nuvolari took his place in the Auto Union team. It was a phenomenal race. Nuvolari very much emulating any of the great aces we'd ever raced before. World War II then ensued, and I'm afraid poor old Donington fell into disrepair. After the war, it had been requisitioned by the Ministry of Defense. Enter a gentleman called Tom Wheatcroft. Well, he'd been present at those two races where the German teams did so well. Decided that he would make it one of his life's ambitions to buy Donington and enable it to have a full FIA World Championship Grand Prix race there. Well, what then took place was a load of arguments, fights and squabbles with town planners, country planners, local people, the Royal Automobile Club, goodness knows what. But in the end, Tom had his way. 
You know, it's amazing what you can find here at Donington. This is a 1999 Penske Champ Car. It was driven by Al Unser Jr. in that series. But you know, it's the very last Penske that was designed and built in England down at Poole in Dorset. Well, I think we've probably seen enough of the wonderful cars here at Donington. Should we go and meet the man who made it all possible? He's just along here somewhere. Hello, Tom. How, How are, are you Alan? today? Very good, good to morning. see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Good. great. You know, it's great walking around the museum. I'm amazed to see the American content here. Champ cars and indie cars and stuff. It's lovely. Well, we thought we ought to have a little bit of indie stuff uh, with the Grand Prix cars, just to blend in and give it a little bit of a break. As we've had so many drivers go to Indy now, you know, Jimmy Clark set it all off and Jackie Stewart and Graham Hill, we thought we'd better mix it a bit. You know, I've been reading your wonderful book, Thunder in the Park. I couldn't put it down. But I think there's a few stories that you missed out of that, so I thought I might take you down the pub and you can fill me in. Yes, that'll take a while, you know. You know, Tom, this is a... A 1931 Invicta, which was born the same year as the first ever race here at Donington Park, and I know you've always wanted to go for a ride in one. Yes, and I was here that day as well, but I don't remember the Invicta. <laughs> uh. 